in the New Testament. So that we do know that they were reading at those times, like Eusebius was one of the first generation scholars. So when he writes something that he was reading in his time, we know that if there's, we have that later, then we know that those two things agree. Yes, this has existed since this time, even though there may not be no evidence of it textually, we have quotations of it from, from, from the church fathers. So this is how they go about it in, 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 in getting these things together. Now this holds a lot of problems for us, and Bart Ehrman comes to one of these um, in general, and I'm going to get to some other things, but this is one of the logical problems that Bart Ehrman puts down for the New Testament, all without having to go through all of this stuff right here. If Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are eyewitness accounts, and I'm going to tell you the argument that is given against this, but if they are New Testament accounts, and Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke, John wrote John, that is somewhat disproved by who these people were. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were first century people living in Palestine. They were first century men living in Palestine from the city of Galilee. They were from the city of Galilee. Matthew was a fisherman. Uh, Luke was a tax collector. I think Mark was also a fisherman. And uh, John, I can't remember off the top of my head what he did. Um, but they were all lower class. They were all low class citizens living in first century Galilee. And the language that they spoke was, take a guess anyone? Aramaic. They spoke Aramaic, which there's very few places existed on the world that still speak this language. One of them I do want to visit is in Syria. I plan to visit this year, inshallah, is uh, Maulala. Maulala in Syria is one of the oldest places where you can really find real uh, uh, Aramaic. I would love to be able to go there and study Aramaic before it disappears off the face of the earth. Um, they spoke Aramaic. And according to statistics and historians in the first century, about less than 1% of the population was literate. Was literate on a level that they could read and write. About 1% of the population of Palestine and of Galilee, moreover, was literate to be able to read and write. And the lower class would have been even more minuscule than that. The lower class did not learn to read and write because they were not able to afford the cap capability to do so, nor were they able to afford the time to do so. Because someone who's a fisherman, he spends all of his time fishing. Someone who's a tax collector, he spends all of his time collecting taxes. They don't have time to go to school. Not only that, so, so according to history, Matthew, Martin, Luke, and John would have been first century Christian, or first century uh, Palestinians from Galilee who spoke Aramaic, who were illiterate. And Luke even refers to them in Acts. Whoever wrote Acts, uh, in Acts it's referred to that some of the disciples, including Luke, were unlettered. This is the word that is used as unlettered, meaning they were illiterate. Now, the books of the New Testament that we have were written in what language? Hebrew. Not Hebrew. Greek. Greek. They were written in Greek. And they were written on a level of literary scholarship of that time. So you mean to tell me that first century Palestinians from Galilee who spoke Aramaic, who most likely did not know how to read and write, wrote Greek manuscripts in a language that they did not speak, in a literary prose that was at the highest level of scholarship of the time. Now, this is where a smart Christian will come back. Most of them, they won't come back. Most of them, this will be enough for them. But the diversion can come where they will say that, oh yeah, but the, um, the, um, the disciples received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that taught them the languages of the world that, did not know, they, that they did not know. So they will come back to you on this point. And so I just rebuttal with them, well then you need to show me evidence that these people wrote these books or that Paul and them run around spoken Greek, I mean that any of the disciples ran around spoken Greek. If you can give me one instance of a, of a disciple speaking Greek, uh, then we will appease you with this. And yes, they spoke the languages of the world they didn't know, 
So I guess they were taught how to read and write through the Holy Spirit at Pentecost as well. How to write. It says they spoke the languages of the world they did not know. There's a big difference and there's a big link between speaking and reading and writing. But then, you get it, but then you're getting now yourself into a black hole with them. Uh, if, if they go down this road, you're getting yourself into a black hole where you just need to tell them that you need to pr produce for me some evidence that they wrote these books. Because then you're getting them to a point where they say, well, the Holy Spirit can, living inside of one can make them to be able to do anything. So, so it's like, this is what I tell people, without proper understanding, debating with a Christian is like chasing mirage. When you think you've caught it, it's gone. You know, so you have to be wary. But this is the logical understanding that first century Christian, or first century Palestinians in Galilee who spoke Aramaic wouldn't, could not have produced the level of authorship that we have in the New Testament. And if, what is we have left? So this is one of the evidences that you're able to go with them. And one of the... Now, with what we have, I'm going to give you this. What we have left, as far as the official tabulation of the documents that exist, that means that there are documents that are pieces. The, the, what, what has existed of the Bible are sometimes... Um, full manuals written in other languages, sometimes there are a page here, a page there, all the way down to they found a really, really old um, credit card size piece of the book of John in a trash bin in Egypt. Um, but So when you tabulate all of those different references that we have up, the official tabulation as of uh, in the early, in the mid 90s was 5,660 different documents of this one book, the New Testament. There's 5,000, and now it's almost to 7,000. Almost 7,000 existing documents of what we now know as the New Testament. And the difficulty about that is they, the majority of them are in disagreement. What I mean by the majority of them being in disagreement is they do not say the same thing. Almost none of them. Almost none of them say the exact same thing. So the scholars have to go through and sift through this amount of material and try to classify these documents into different groupings, into different uh, uh, things that agree with each other, things that agree with church authors, and it's all this craziness to do to try to find out what was the original thought of the author who wrote the book. Because there's no originals. Now how did this happen? This happened because of the process of how we received the New Testament. Because of the simple fact that the originals were most likely not witness accounts. They already start off bad. Number two, they were copied by hand for a long time. And if I were to give all of you this book and ask all of you to copy it by hand and then give it to five people, who copy it by hand. When I get all of those back, do you think they're going to be the same? No. They're not going to be the same. There's going to be so many errors we're not going to be able to count and it might not even look like this anymore. And that's just on a small scale. That's just like a what they call a controlled experiment. With the New Testament, we have an uncontrolled catastrophe going on. Because it's all throughout the world, many people copying it, giving the people copy it, giving the people copy it. And so there were mistakes made in... in um, uh, uh, by mistake. There were mistakes made by mistake. The people just made mistakes in their copying. And then there were other mistakes, as Paul points out in these, I mean, as Bart points out in these two books, Jesus mis Interrupted and Misquoting Jesus, there were mistakes made for theological reasons. As is what Kenneth Craig was saying. That there were, mis there were changes made because a scribe would get a book of the New Testament and read it, and he needs to copy it. One thing that might happen is he would see that there are some um, grammatical problems with what is wrote, written, so he would just change it. Or it wasn't saying things correctly, so he would just change it. Or the things that were being said were against the theology of where he was sending the book, or the book, or, he, or the, where he's living. So he would just, you know, change a couple letters, words here to make it say something completely different. And then that would get copied and copied and copied. And we have actually um, Greek manuscripts left that prove this. There's one Greek manuscript that has about four scribbles on it from scribes who came later on and argued with each other about the changes that they were making. 
And at the end, one of the, one of the scribes says, you, I can't really give you 